Welcome to the behind the scenes of the Natural History Museum. My name is Shatuki and I'm joined here by Lewis today, a museum scientist, and we're going to be talking all about Xenophora, also known as curious snails or carrier shells. I have lots of questions to get started, but right off the bat, I'm kind of interested to know why Xenophora actually collect these shells. What's the benefit they're going, um, they have with this? Yeah, well, it's interesting to see this specimen here where there aren't actually any shells at all. So they don't always collect shells, but you can see that they might be a bit more fragile. So there's some pieces broken off here. Then one of the benefits of adding some uh, pieces onto their shell is to reinforce the shell. And so they don't have to actually uh, excrete the calcium carbonate themselves. Uh, they can just add chunks on, which helps them expend less energy. So they might become a lot more bulky, like this one here, for example, the width is greatly increased um, and the um, predators that may go for them uh, might find that harder to deal with. They're, they're also a lot more spiky, um, so they're more likely to be left alone. Additionally, it just looks like, to some predators, it looks more like just a pile of empty shells rather than a prey item. And also uh, it creates these kind of little um, safe spaces underneath for the uh, snail to come out and feed under there um, and have some protection from uh, predators around them. That makes sense. And how do they actually do it? I'm guessing they stick it to themselves somehow? Yes, yeah, so the uh, snails have uh, a single foot on the bottom and they move along the, um, the sea floor. And when they find a piece of uh, a shell or rock or coral that they like the look of, they pick it up uh, with their foot and uh, they secrete a uh, calcium carbonate in a protein matrix, which is the same uh, stuff that they use to basically grow their shells normally, um, but they use it as a glue and then they glue it on. And as they grow, uh, more shells build up and then you end up with uh, these really complex looking um, designs here. Mm. And it's also interesting to see how different the um, different organisms are in terms of how they've attached and also the different species on their backs as well. And you mentioned that it helps them um, deter predators as well. So what type of predators are trying to eat these snails? Yeah, good question. So um, they're often predated upon by things like fish and uh, octopuses and crustaceans might try and have a go at them, but they're far less likely to when they're uh, covered in all of these fragments. Yeah, they do look sp uh, spiky. I would not want to go for it myself if I was their predator. Is there any other examples, for example, in, in the animal kingdom um, where the organisms kind of get help from what they have in their environment to like, maybe to defend themselves as well, just like xenophora? Oh, yeah. Well, in the UK, in uh, freshwater habitats like uh, streams and ponds, caddisfly larvae, um, they use um, the th items that are around them to reinforce their cases. So yeah, there are other examples of this um, which have evolved in an entirely different way. Mm. And I suppose with using things in the environment, something to be mindful of is potentially like uh, marine pollution as well. You know, we know a lot of um, plastics are now ending up in the oceans and is there actually like evidence of carrier snails using like plastic that they're finding? Yes, there is. So we're finding more of these carrier shells uh, incorporating plastic and other bits of rubbish from the sea floor. These uh, materials have never actually been used by uh, the carrier shells, the xenophora, in the past. So they will have different densities, different buoyancies. It could affect um, the stability of the shell. It could also, they often have bright colours, so it could uh, stand out more to potential predators. Um, and also these pieces of litter in the ocean, like plastics, often secrete uh, toxic chemicals. Mm -hmm. um, microplastics could start to come off them and go into the surrounding ecosystems. So there's a whole host of different uh, issues here with uh, the plastics and the xenophora. Mm. And I know there's examples of like, even like birds that collect different plastics from if they're using their nests and stuff, that could also be kind of an implication. Yeah, that's interesting to know. And another thing that I'm kind of noting through looking at these specimens is like, like I said before, the variety of different species 
that they're picking up from the environment. I'm thinking, is there kind of a potential way that you can even monitor um, the different species of, let's say, marine life and shells in, t in where the carrier snails are residing? Yes, definitely. So these could be used as, a, and they are used as bioindicators. So, you know, they have a, a good selection of different types of shells, bivalves and corals and small stones on some of them here. You know, it could have an indicator of what the ecosystem is like in that area. So if there's a lot of pieces of coral attached, it could indicate a healthy coral reef. Mm. Um, if there's lots of pieces of broken shells, that could indicate um, high predation levels. Mm. So a lot of potential we can tap into with, yeah, yeah, with the carrier shells. Amazing. Thank you um, for talking to us, Lewis. I've definitely heard a lot more um, than I knew about career, career shells. But yeah, thanks. Thanks for talking to me. What an interesting chat I had with Lewis just there. Let us know in the comments below if you were to carry something on your back, what would you carry? And don't forget to like, comment and subscribe to keep up with more natural history content.